I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Welcome to the BWI Daily Edition, and we've saved the best for last. We've introduced you to everybody here on our YouTube channel and, of course, on our podcast network. Uh, Ryan Stater, Greg Pickle, they have their recruiting podcast. It's a big week for recruiting. Denai Dennis Sutton is set to make his commitment announcement tomorrow at 5 p.m. We'll have coverage for you, of course, whichever way that goes here on Blue White Illustrated. Yesterday, Dave Eckert joined me on the BWI Daily Edition to talk a little bit of uh, PSU analytics and some hoops recruiting. But like I said, we saved the best for last. Senior editor Nate Bauer joins me today. Nate, welcome. I got a little bit of a bone to pick with you, honestly. It hurts you my feelings. I, I yeah, Listen, no call. I could have come earlier. I, I've been hanging out. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I, I, I am not a, so this is the thing. I'm not necessarily the best when it comes to, uh, leading with the right sentence, you know, like if you're writing something, you want to have your most important sentence first. I am much more of a, Hey, I'm going to lead you into it. I want to get you yeah. interested. And then bam, surprise at the end. So okay. you're my surprise okay. at the end. you you I right. like to, I like to save the surprise and the flourish for the end. And I work, need work, some heavy hitters for that. Work out the kinks and then get yes. to me. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's okay. I'll work. Yeah. With that. Plus, I had to I had to build all the graphics to put on uh, the thing to make it look nice. So I wanted to do that before we got onto the uh, onto the bigger and better things. But here we are. The BWI Daily Edition is uh, evolving as we speak, and apparently, I'm devolving into Elmer Fudd. The <laughs> BWI Daily Edition. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about your article uh, from this week. You've been doing a summer series of interviews with the Penn State coaches, and the thing everybody wants to know is the offense going to be better in 2021. You sat down with a guy who's responsible for that. Mike Yersich and had a conversation with him. Uh, when it comes to that particular idea, what was his view and his philosophy on how to get there? Cause that's really what even, you know, he's tasked with. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, I, I mean, I think I would start by saying that he was non-committal, <laughs> <laughs> as to, as to uh, uh, for, for a lot of things, but certainly as to how good they're going to be, um, you, you know, but he really did kind of lay out what the plan is, right? And so the plan for him, the way that he builds an offense is to establish a language and get everyone on the same page as to what that language is. And it's really, you know, we talk about football and it's, it's, it seems not that complicated, I guess, to me at times, I'm sure to you, it's extraordinarily complicated. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll but, get to that in a minute though. But, but, but the way, but the way that they do it, I mean, it, it it's really like learning a, a, a musical or a show, you know, like an actor learning yeah. uh, or, or a foreign language, um, you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, yeah. It's just kind of remarkable the way that they use language to, uh, to link it to themes and to plays and to all of these different things that they want to do. And so really, if you're not all speaking the same language, this is the bottom line and a long way to say it. But if you're not all speaking the la same language from the get go, you're done. There's, there's nothing yeah. to build from. Um, and so I think, I think that that is really the essence of, of how he likes this to, to move. Um, but, but then once it's there, once you are on that same page, he really uh, goes all in, right? It, it is, it is throwing you into uh, adverse situations constantly as mm -hmm. uh, every, every, uh, possible football scenario that you can think of. It, it is about running you through those and getting the reps and making it so that once you get into a game, nothing surprises you, right? right? And and we know very, very well <laughs> at Penn State, certainly uh, last season, they had some, a couple of situations that were very unique, um, yeah. you know, that, that might not have gone the way that uh, they, they would have preferred. And so that's that's kind of how that's kind of how they they start and go from there. So it's interesting you the way you described that. I, the only thing I would add is it is exactly like you say, like learning to rehearse a musical. The only thing is if you're doing the Phantom of the Opera in football, 
uh, the cast of Hamilton comes on stage and tries to beat you up in the middle of your performance. So the, yeah. it's it, it like it is in so many ways what you're describing. And then because it is a contact adversarial sport, it's so fascinating how that works because, uh, you know, the, the, what it sounds like from what Mike Yersich said is everything that you just talked about is the idea of what spring practice should be of installing mm -hmm. all of that information, throwing as much at you as possible, and then allowing you, the football player, over the summer to then go into everything that you just went over and try to learn that on your own. Yep. To me, that's the biggest question. And that's the biggest part of what I wanted to talk to you about because I thought he had some fascinating conversations and insights into film study, especially yep. at the quarterback position. And that's what everyone wants to know. Is Sean Clifford going to be better in 2021? Really, it's about the offense, but it's really about Sean Clifford. So yeah. when he talked about film study and he talked about um, not just – watching film but watching it the right way what did you learn from your conversation with him about how he wants his quarterbacks to watch film and what he wants them to do and to learn while they're doing that i this is a, a little bit of a tangent but i, I had a conversation with a, a penn state quarterback years ago um a, a former former starter and he was talking about how in practice um you know one of his backups you know, he would step to the line and, and point and, and shout things and right. Like, and, and as the starter, he didn't really understand what the kid was doing, what, what was happening. And he asked the guy, he was like, Hey, you know, what, what's going on with some of that stuff. And, and the kid told him, uh, yeah, I just saw those guys on TV doing it. I thought it was like, <laughs> I thought this is what you did. Like I thought, right? And <laughs> like, like monkey see, monkey do, just pantomiming. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just like, you know, like you, you couldn't blame the kid. He was 18, 19 years old at the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, but, but you get to that point, and I think that it kind of ties into what to what Mike Yersich was saying, which is that you can make assumptions when you're his age and when you've been in the game for as long as he has that guys have a fundamental understanding of how to watch film and, and what you're picking up from it. And sometimes that's not the case. So, right. I mean, everybody's right. coming in at different levels of, of coaching and experience and all, all of those different things. It doesn't matter, um, you know, necessarily what they've shown on film and how, how highly recruited they are. Sometimes you can get into a program and, and not necessarily have those, those building blocks to work from. And mm -hmm. so that's, that was the, the big thing that he kind of established with me was that, hey, this is, this is, you have to be able to set these guys up, particularly at the quarterback position, to understand what you're watching for. What, what are you actually watching when you're watching film? And take those elements so that you can, you can, yeah, you're not, you're not just spending time with the film because yeah, every, you know, uh, they talk all the time about guys who spend the most hours watching film. That's, that's something that the program can track, right? Is, is yeah. how many hours uh, these players actually watch film. But if you're not watching it uh, intently and with the right focus, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, right. it's uh, work, work smart, uh, not long. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it's, the other thing that I think is interesting, and he kind of hints at this, but this is really another layer to all of that is you may understand, and he goes a little bit into, into in the article, if you want to check it out, bwi.rivals.com. He goes into how, you know, the different coverages you can be looking at and what you want to do yep. there, but that's different in every offense, like how you approach those things is the separator between one offense and the other. So the idea of watching film now he's got, now Sean Clifford has to see it through the eyes of Mike Yersich. And one of the things that you have hinted at before. And one of the things that I think is, is really important in an offensive coordinator and in a coach in general is communication. Um, do you think that Mike Yersich is a good communicator and do you think that he is an effective teacher at that position for Sean, especially, but for the offense in general? That's a great question. I mean, I think that the, look, I've, I've known him or been around Mike Yersich for a total of what, five months, six months, right. uh, and really personal interactions. Yeah. I mean, it's limited to, to a couple. Um, and so, you know, being able to say definitively, 
yeah, I, I probably can't do that. But what I would say is that the track record speaks for itself uh, with, with Mike Yersich. And the fact that it's, it's not just talking to Mike Yersich. Now, I, obviously, I had my own interaction with him. And I, I don't know what your perception of the, the interview was, but it was frenetic. He, yeah. is, a, he is a frenetic guy. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that, yes, that was my interaction with him. But then when I also had an interview with Sean Clifford, Sean's talking about really the same thing, that as soon as Mike Yersich gets to the football building, he is ah, just yeah. football, 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 football. And, and he is that way. And he's passionate about it and, it and it engages you. And sometimes you might not know what he's talking about. I'm, I'm saying from Sean Clifford's perspective, you <laughs> might not know exactly what's going on, but you're going to pick up on it and you're going you're gonna to get onto the same page uh, at some point a, a, along the way based on how passionate he is for, for what he's talking about. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that certainly he, he's got a track record that kind of speaks for itself in terms of its success. And for Sean Clifford, Sean's a smart kid. He, he really is. I mean, he's just a, he's a, he's a bright, smart kid. And so if, if that's who you're asking to be able to pick these concepts up, uh, Sean's very, very well suited uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that it's interesting that that hasn't necessarily translated completely to the field, but you know, I know you and I have had long conversations about the effect of 2020 in general and, and don't necessarily want to get into those again today because it's just like you could spend a whole month dissecting all the things that happened. Um, and, and I kind of, I do want to focus on 2021 uh, because it is just around the corner. The 2021 Penn State football preview issue also, a 116-page full-color magazine, comprehensive guide to the Nittany Lions upcoming season packed with exclusive interviews, features, opinions, and analysis. Of course, you'll get great analysis from somebody like Nate Bauer, who's with me on the BWI Daily Edition, our senior editor. You can learn more about the uh, football preview issue at comanpub.com backslash BWI preview or by calling customer service 814-234-1177 Monday through Friday. That's 814-237-1177 during normal business hours. Nate, I was looking this up because this is something that I've I've been thinking about to give people the answer because I know I know you talk to probably more people than I do, but all of the people I've interacted with are, are, are asking me, Clifford, the offense in general, in better in 2021. So I looked at it just kind of quick, broad strokes overview of Penn State's transition between coordinators um over the years and and i used some some pff stats and i used some broad numbers of touchdowns and yards the only season where there was a transition between guys calling the plays where there was an, an output that was increased was between 2015 and 2016 and it was the most dramatic one of of any of them because you went from christian hackenberg who threw for 2,500 yards and 16 touchdowns to then Trace McSorley throwing almost 30 touchdowns and 3,600 yards with Joe Moorhead as the offense coordinator. E like every other transition between then so far has been, it's taken time. What are, are you expecting something similar in 2021 with uh, Mike Yersich installing his offense? That's a great question because Right now, I think that I have Penn State winning that game at Wisconsin. But now that you mention it, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I still feel that way. No, I don't know. I mean, even if you look back at, at Joe Moorhead's uh, time at Penn State, those first four games weren't pretty. Yep. Necessarily. Yep. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, I think that, and it's one of my critiques of you know, look, like we're, we're coming at this from different places, right? I, I'm interacting with fans and I, I get what their perspective is. And there's frustration when things don't just work, yeah. right? Yep. So, so from, but for, from my perspective and the media, I'm, I'm coming at this with clear eyes and, and I'm biased and I'm saying, okay, well, guys, like things take time. This is, this is a process. This is something that doesn't just happen overnight. And in a lot of cases, you know, your and this is honestly another point that Yersich made in his interview is that you can't simulate a game in practice at this yep. level. 
and you can't get anywhere close to it, uh, particularly with the running game. And so those elements say to me, all right, look, uh, as fans, you might want it to be pretty and spectacular, especially after last season and some of, some of what you saw. Yep. But Mike Yersich is telling you this is going to take some time. Um, you know, uh, even Phil Trowine last year on the offensive line, they understood without a spring practice and without summer reps due to COVID and, and you know, the, the limitations that that created, the offensive line on a ground up rebuild of its technique was not going to be in good shape once yeah. the season started. They just, they weren't going to be ready. Uh, there was, there was no way for that to happen. And not only was there no way for that to happen based on COVID, but just in general, when you're yeah. bringing in a new coach and you're trying to establish these new things, it takes time. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that that's uh, a, a valid concern. It's just a question of, all right, where they were last year and the offense that you saw at the end of the season, which uh, really evolved through the course of the season to become a zero sum game of, I, I think devolved don't lose, devolved, <laughs> devolved well, I mean, might be better than evolved, but you're right. No, what you're right is what it became at the end of the season. And it's, and it's so funny though, because you, you look at it and I look back at some of the Christian Hackenberg years and I saw very much the same thing where yeah. what they wanted to do was not something based on personnel limitations that they could do. Right. Yeah. You, you lose your two starting running backs and all of a sudden it's not just that your third string running back might not have the talent as a running back as the, the top two guys. It's that the pass protection isn't there, yep. right? It's that it's that the offensive lines pass protection isn't there. So all, all of these different things come into play when, you know, when we evaluate Sean Clifford that, yeah, okay, this is, this is what the plan was at the beginning of the season. And we all know, that plan got blown up. And so as the season went along and you saw how much that plan got blown up, you have to dial it back to the point where it's, okay, well, we're just going to beat you physically. And that's what Penn state ended up doing. I think over the last four games, well, if you've got that to build from, and now you have some of those pieces coming back in that, that were lost last year, I'm talking obviously about Noah Kane, um, you know, that's going to make a difference. Um, that that's a, that's a, that's a better starting point to build from uh, than necessarily where you were in, you know, the beginning end of December last season. Yeah. And w one thing I think is fair to point out too, is the difference between 2015 and 2016 is it probably couldn't have gotten worse in that final year in 2015 with Christian Ackenberg. I don't know that it could have gotten worse in 2020 than it did. So it, it can only go up from what 2020 was. Uh, and part of what you just said, the personnel to do what you want, some of the deep down the field stuff that, that Mike Yersich likes to do with the offense and, and running vertical routes up field requires receivers. And one of the interesting mm -hmm. quotes, I want to pull this directly from your conversation with him. I don't know how much I'm able to really cover with those guys yet. I think we need some game reps before I get into all the evaluations of everybody right there. That's really interesting. Do you think that it's because of a true unknown there, or is he still holding off on, they may be hoping that some of those freshmen that are arriving in August will be part of the equation. So he doesn't have all the information so far. That's a great question. I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's that. I don't think it's that, you know, uh, you're, you're waiting on the, the, the freshman pieces necessarily. I think that just in general and what you see once I transitioned into personnel questions at the end of the, the interview, he didn't really talk about anybody. Right. <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't really, he didn't really talk about anybody specifically. And I, and I think that that's probably his personal preference, but I think it's also honestly probably fair, right? You, you just, yeah. Through, through 15 spring practices and winter workouts and, you know, uh, the interview was conducted in June. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have that sense of what guys are going to be when the lights are on at Beaver Stadium. It's just, it's just a consistent storyline is right. you have one, you have one data set to work from and you put them in all these different situations and you, you, you do the best that you can to simulate that, but it's just, it's a totally different thing 
being in that stadium and playing that game against the opponent that's not wearing the same colors as you. It, yeah. It's just, it's just different. And so, you know, Sean Clifford, he can, he can make an assessment that, yeah, Sean's doing the right things and Sean's uh, in a position where you think that he's got an opportunity to have success because he's shown that in practices in, in the spring. He's shown that in seven on seven and all of those different environments. It's the same thing with the, the receivers. It's the same thing with the running backs. Like you, you, you know that you have some talent, but especially at the receiver position, it's literally all about consistency. That's it is can you duplicate the play 10 times right. that you just made? Because, because, and, and James Franklin has said this, I'm not offering any new insight here. James Franklin has said that these got every single one of the guys, like you wouldn't be at this level if you couldn't make spectacular plays. If, if you couldn't make the one handed, the, the highlight, all of that stuff, you wouldn't be at this level. But the question is who are the guys who are going to, actually catch the ball eight out of 10 times when it's in the vicinity when it's, you know, cause the ball's not going to be perfect every time. Yeah. And so that's, and so that's, I think the hurdle that, that they're working with this off season is really, uh, and you can attest to this from the PFF side of things. Even if you look back at Parker Washington, um, you're, you're looking at one guy who among that group who has really demonstrated that he can do it. Uh, at this level and and do it with that type of consistency and that's Jahan Dotson after yeah. that who who I who a ton I, of unknown yeah and who I think at the beginning of the season you talked about when the lights come on I always thought Jahan was a good receiver I didn't know his profile was going to be the the contested catch monster that goes up and mosses people like that's yeah, something right. in his profile that did not appear before last year so that you're right that there is that but there is what we have on tape and there is some assertion of seeing guys in live situations, how they work in your offense might be different, but that's the only area I might push back on is you have some idea of what well, these guys are. And, and to your point about Parker Washington, there might be some hidden production there as well, even yeah. if on film it hasn't been what you're looking for. I, I just think it's a question of, uh, you know, particularly with the, the true freshman Parker Washington and Keandre Lambert Smith, is it fair to ju is it fair to say that they're a finished product after the first season? No, right. obviously not. Right. Uh, it, you know, and then you've got a guy uh, in Cam Sullivan Brown who was out last year for all intents. Per you know, he he finished with seven games played or six games played, something like that. But like, he really didn't play. He didn't get the reps. Mm -hmm. And that was a guy who the expectations going into the season last year are that he was going to compete or be a starter, be one of the starting three. So you know. When, when you have guys who just for one reason or another haven't been on the field or guys early in their career, there's a, a little bit of, it's, a, it's just an unknown. You just, you're just really not quite sure what you're going to get once they get into that environment. I always love talking to you, Nate. And more than I love that, no Same. disrespect, is that I love hearing any quote possible from coaches and and you do a great job of getting good wow. conversations out of coaches your summer interviews there's also one with james franklin we didn't even touch on that one today so if you want to check out all of nate's conversations with james franklin mike Yersich, and the rest of the coaching staff that he's done so far bwi.rivals.com you have to subscribe because the good stuff tends to end up on the message board where Nate gives some of his more uh, uh, candid insights into the situation. So subscribe today. And of course, subscribe here to the YouTube page and wherever you get your podcast for the BWI Daily and all the stuff we're growing on social media. Nate, thanks so much. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I love the way that you phrase that. Instead of just saying, Nate tells all the secrets. <laughs> right, listen, it's all I was like, you, you got to come. You got to come close. You got to come. Come here. Come here. Come here. And then I'll tell you.